Hello and welcome to Round Table. Why did so many African countries fail to condemn Russia's actions in Ukraine, just as they failed to do so over the annexation of Crimea eight years ago? Many have ties to Russia, but another reason put forward is that they got support from the old Soviet Union when fighting to free themselves from colonial rumors. Good to have your company. I'm David Foster. While the majority of African countries did side with Ukraine in the General Assembly vote, 17 nations abstained and one Eritrea voted against the resolution. But it was South Africa's abstention that caught the attention of diplomats and political commentators. Did the former USSR's support for the African National Congress during the apartheid years sway that decision? While many Western countries continued to trade, with white minority rule South Africa. We can welcome to this edition of Roundtable out of London, Arno Odoye, Russia Eurasia Program Fellow at Chatham House. Then we go to South Africa to Johannesburg and we welcome Ethel Kuya, Public Sector Reform, Economy and Corporate Transformation Advisor further south in the same country, South Africa, Cape Town this time, and Robert Bessling is with us, Chief Exec of Pangea Risk. Great to have you all with us. I'm going to bring up a map, first of all, of those countries that abstained and those that voted in favor, spread right the way across the continent. I'll pick out Algeria, that abstained, Uganda, Zimbabwe, South Africa. They also abstained. We'll find out what reasons they gave, if any. And then we go to those that voted in favor, condemned Russia's action. Mauritania, Egypt, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenya, and Zambia, to name just a few. Now, Anu, I know that Africa is not a country. It is a continent. They all have different reasons. But is there anything that links those countries that decided not to condemn Russia's action? Is there any common theme? Thank you for having me. I mean, like you said, there's almost no pattern to how all these different countries voted in the UN uh, resolution three weeks ago. But I think um, we can look at how the National Liberation Movement parties of Southern Africa voted in this uh, resolution. If you look at South Africa, Tanzania, Mozambique, Angola, Namibia, and Zimbabwe, these are all countries that have fond memories of how supportive the Soviet Union was during their fight against colonial and minority rule. And so, so uh, and if you look at that, the fact that the ruling party in each of these countries are still the same parties that fought for liberation, and so they're still in charge, and the ideology and affinity for the Soviet Union remains in place. I remember what the Soviet Union did in Angola, but the other countries you mentioned, uh, what sort of aid did they get, help did they get, and encouragement from uh, the USSR? South Africa, for example, you have uh, party grandees of the ANC who spent time um, for military and education training in the old Soviet Union. Uh, the former president of South Africa, Mr. Jacob Zuma, spent some time in, in Moscow uh, training uh, during his time as the leader of uh, the ANC's intelligence unit. Ethel, let me come to you. You're in South Africa. Um, you are from Zimbabwe, two of the countries that have already been been referenced. Do you see links between those two? Because I, if I remember rightly, um, fighters from South Africa, members of the ANC, when they were outlawed there, would go to Zimbabwe for training. Were they helped there by the Soviet Union? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Most definitely, Zimbabwe relied uh, quite significantly on the support of the Soviet Union um, during the liberation struggle to the extent that a lot of the military um, equipment that was provided, uh, the famous uh, rifle, um, which is also born on the Mozambican flag, um, is a Russian um, product. So certainly that support exists, but also the extent of education. Uh, Russia, during the, the, the days when it was the Soviet Union, uh, very much strengthened uh, education and opened its doors to not just African, but also Asian uh, young people to take them through education in there. And there currently is 
uh, cooperation uh, relationship between uh, Russia and about 49 universities on the continent. Um, in addition to that, the economic ties are, are, are pretty strong and especially for Zimbabwe have been strengthening in the face of uh, ongoing sanctions from especially the United States. Uh, if you recall in, in Mugabe's days uh, at the time that the sanctions were brought up, he introduced a look east policy and that has been growing in, in, in some uh, strength over time. There's a difference between <laughs> feeling grateful to somebody who's helped you in the past and supporting them now if it affects your interests detrimentally. There are those African nations who are saying, listen, we, we owe Russia, the former Soviet Union, we owe it something. Is there not a, a realization that they could be harming perhaps their own interests? I, I don't think actually that they voted to abstain because of a sense of owing them, because they are countries that have received support from uh, the Soviet Union and even Russia that did vote. Um, uh, to take on the resolution. I think it's important to note that these countries have got their own individual foreign policies. Um, if we look at Zimbabwe, for example, uh, in the face of it still trying to re-engage and strengthen re-engagement with the West, it has increasingly created deals with uh, Russia, uh, cutting across energy, um, mining, and even uh, military support. So I think their reasons, present-day reasons, are different from um, reasons to do with uh, feeling grateful. I think it goes much to a more points more to a strategic position for themselves in terms of how they're looking at their food security, um, the geopolitics of of the issues at hand, as well as their ongoing infrastructure programs that they have that Russia has been supporting quite strongly, especially in the southern part of Africa. Interesting, you should say that because we've got some figures here, China is actually Africa's largest trading partner. And last year's growth actually strengthens the position. The value of trade between Africa and China rose by 35% and went up to $254 billion last year. Russia, Africa trade, well, that's in excess of $20 billion, but nothing like the, the deal with China. And European Union trade with Africa stood at $321 billion last year. US. Uh, 64 billion. Robert, I want to bring you in at this particular point. Why does, sorry, I'm treating it almost as if it is a country, but why do some African countries, let me put it that way, feel that they owe more perhaps to Russia than to China if trade is the answer? Um, you know, I, I think we're reading almost too much into this vote at the UN General Assembly. The UN General Assembly, as it sanctioned Russia, actually doesn't have much clout. The only common denominator, which you mentioned earlier, all of these 54 African countries have, is symbolism. This was a symbolic vote at the UN General Assembly. It hasn't happened in about 40 years or something. Um, and um, it was an opportunity for many African countries to make a symbolic statement, rather than a strategic one or a macroeconomic one. Um, and I think many of these countries here, they... Um, as the other guest mentioned, they may be larking back to the days when the Soviet Union supported independence movements or countries on the east of Africa where they're looking at grain and wheat imports and the importance of that. But many of them here are essentially making a statement that they are looking for, that they're not looking to intervene. They don't want to be pro-West. They don't want to be a, a pro-Russia. They're seeing this as a problem which is not African and they don't want to intervene in this. If this had been a UN Security Council vote, on the other hand, it would be very interesting to see how Africa had voted then. The previous UN Security Council vote, three African member states on the UN Security Council all condemned Russia. So, and that was much less con a symbolic vote, obviously. So I, I think there's a lot more to read into, into uh, uh, this conversation about this particular vote. Okay. Um hypothetical here, and you may just dismiss it out of hand, but I want to go back to China once again. Massive trade with African countries, Russia, not so much. Had China done something similar, would the African countries have felt more likely to fall in line with China because of the jeopardy in, in condemning that country? Or is that irrelevant entirely? I would think so. You know, David, you just read those stats. Uh, Russia's trade with um, Africa is about a tenth uh, or even less than China's. 
China's relationships with the African continent uh, are on the diplomatic, on the security, on the military, on the economic, the trade level. With Russia, it's a very small trading relationship. But Russia does um, shoot above its weight in terms of military and security collaboration. But that's not enough to risk uh, a much broader European, US, much broader Western support. So I, I actually agree with the premise you put out, the hypothetical or not, that the um, trading uh, relationship between Africa and China is far more substantial, far more sustainable as well, and far more diversified. And that actually, in this hypothetical situation, would have been quite different. OK, back to realities. Arno, I want to ask you about BRICS, uh, the arrangement between Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, and whether that falls into this equation. It's not something that we hear very much about at the moment, but does it fall into looking after BRICS, looks after African interests? I mean, I think saying that BRICS would look after African interests might be a stretch because there's only one African country in BRICS, um, South Africa, as you know. Um, so, I, And I think BRICS is this club of, of, com of countries who seek to provide an alternative to the Western-led world order as they see it. Uh, but there's only one African country in it. It's, it's, it's only South Africa. So I would be uh, reticent to say that BRICS is essentially looking after the interests of African states. OK. USA's ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, she was calling on African nations to stand up to Russia, to condemn them. Uh, this is a little bit of what she had to say. The voice of every leader, every country, uh, calling on the, the Russians to end this war, I think, is, is important. No voice is too small. Uh, no president is unimportant in this effort. Does the fact that a lot of countries ignored what she had to say mean that they aren't at all worried about what the United States might do, Arno? I mean, I think, like uh, the other panelists said, this was a symbolic vote at the UN General Assembly. And so countries essentially voted how uh, they thought this was going to suit their best interests. And increasingly, people are seeing this as a proxy battle between West and East. And so many countries, so many leaders in Africa, so many policymakers have decided that they would rather stay neutral and avoid getting caught in, in a fight between uh, world powers. And I think the most important thing that I think we're going to get down to is the uh, downstream economic effects of, the, of Russia's invasion and how it's impacting Africa. And I think that's where African countries are much more concerned about And, and are war. we particularly talking about um, food here? Yeah, exactly. Um, food prices are, are, are going up. Um, there was already a high level of food inflation in West Africa prior to the war. And so I think the war is only making a bad situation worse. Ethel, one of the things we've talked about a great deal, understandably, on Roundtable over the last couple of years has been uh, the pandemic, coronavirus, and one of the elements that we examined was what was known as vaccine racism, the fact that many African countries felt that they didn't get enough of a share of what was out there. Does, does that play into this, that they think the West has basically ignored them, that they're only useful uh, when they have something to give? I certainly think that there's, there's definitely a role that the blatant um, and clearly uh, segmented way in which the West uh, dealt with vaccines and access to vaccines for Africa. I think that certainly has played a part in raising the consciousness amongst the various African countries that they have to do more to be self-reliant um, to the extent of uh, not just vaccine preparedness, but even strengthening their, their own individual and collective economies and uh, focusing more on trading uh, with each other. So the, the impact of the COVID-19 and the reaction thereof, uh, if you look at more recently, uh, the fact that the Omicron uh, virus was sequenced in South Africa, but South Africa was uh, very swiftly uh, put on, on a red list, um, I think further cemented the issues that were related to COVID-19. Um, in addition to that, I think one of the signals that is also strengthening as far as uh, Africa now getting, uh, various African countries now getting more focused on self-reliance would be the African Continental Free Trade Agree Area Agreement, the AFCFTA. And um, 
that has been strengthening and a lot more focus has gone into that. So I think certainly they, 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 it's possible that there is a feeling that the West showed its hand and showed where they rank um, importance of, of African states. And uh, that, that probably has made um, various nations sit up. Robert, we're going to put up that map once again that shows which countries abstained. Uh, the one country that voted um, against the resolution, those that supported the resolution condemning Africa. You see there on the West Coast, Nigeria. And I'll come to you, Arno, in just a moment about this very wealthy country or the potential to be extremely wealthy, massive economy. Um, was there a sense that Nigeria had a lot to gain by, if not remaining aligned with the West, they're, they're not, not backing? This was a bit of a surprise to me, too, and I think there was a bit of last-minute diplomatic negotiations going on. Nigeria, like a number of other West African states, recently turned to Russia for a military and security supply agreement. Uh, that was when the U.S. Congress actually held up uh, military uh, purchases for, uh, by Nigeria, uh, and uh, Nigeria actually then said, OK, well, in that case, we'll, we'll turn to Russia. Um, a big... Um, military supply agreement was put in place instead um, and uh, the expectations before that vote were that Nigeria would abstain. Uh, it was at least hinting beforehand that it would do so. So I was a bit surprised but I think there was a, um, uh, in terms of trade and investment and potentially a deal on the uh, military weapons purchases that they've been blocked by Europe and, and the US potentially that there could be some leeway on, on these deals going forward. So uh, Nigeria was clearly uh, persuaded at the last minute uh, to not abstain here. Yeah, Arno, your country, Nigeria, uh, what we're hearing from Robert there is that perhaps it decided that the West was the best horse to back, if you like. It could um, rely on the West perhaps to fill in the gaps when it comes to military help, et cetera, et cetera, that Russia is currently giving or has been giving up till now. But what about this idea of energy, oil rich, Nigeria, would it see this as an opportunity to fill the gap that could be left if Russia is no longer able to sell its oil and gas to the world? Um, unfortunately not. Because Nigeria, despite being an oil-rich country, what Nigeria does is that we take our crude oil from the ground, send it abroad uh, to, be, to be refined because none of our refineries are working uh, to capacity, and then we buy it back in huge subsidies. So I think, uh, contrary to what most people think, that the high price of, of oil would help a country like Nigeria, it has actually been a de detriment to Nigeria. Uh, surprisingly, we had our finance minister saying last week that um, the, the rising, oil price, rising oil prices have been a detriment to the Nigerian economy. Uh, and so I, I think if Nigeria was a different country that we were meeting our OPEC, OPEC uh, distribution levels, that would be a, a different situation entirely. But Nigeria does not have the capacity right now as we speak to produce, to even ramp up production. I mean, would, would you say the same is true of other oil producing African countries? Yeah, essentially, if you look at a country like Angola as well, um, there isn't enough enough infrastructure for these for these African oil producers to ramp to ramp up production. And I think the most interesting thing for me right now is in the age of climate change and so many Western countries and even China saying that they will not finance new fossil fuel um, projects abroad, and wondering if if West and, and China will decide to take this opportunity to reconsider their stance. Because as we well know, Europe is trying to move away from Russian oil and gas. And I imagine that some of them will be looking towards African projects to see if they can uh, supply their oil from there. Okay. Ethel, I want to talk about South Africa's president, because we can concentrate this down in a couple of cases where the personalities are known. Uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, leading member of the African National Congress, you would think that he would know about oppression um, when fighting to end apartheid, goes out, makes a fortune, becomes South Africa's president once he's, once he's a free man. I always had him down as a bit of a libertarian. 
Um, and therefore, I'm, I was quite surprised to see that perhaps he's backing a country that appears to be inflicting such harm on civilians and society. What would his take on this be? I think um, the statement that uh, was made was uh, pretty clear in the sense of making it clear that this is uh, the abstaining of the vote is not uh, condoning and um, is instead uh, calling for more transparency. So I think there was a feeling that the, 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 the manner in which the conditions in the resolution were drawn up was not so transparent and they would have preferred to back a, a different approach. So not so much that they condone what is happening on the ground or that they're supporting the invasion of Ukraine. Um, I think that, the, the, as you've rightly mentioned, the history of, of being oppressed in the past uh, is certainly quite quite fresh and is by no Sorry means going you. unnoticed. Sorry to stop Please. you there, but I'm going to read you out something that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa actually said. War could have been avoided if NATO had heeded the warnings issued by its own leaders and officials over the years that its eastward expansion would lead to greater, not less, instability in the region. Um, does that fit in with your thoughts? To, to an extent. To an extent, I think uh, by no means was this a surprise. However, I think this again is a, a, an option, a strategic option that was taken by South Africa, along with the other countries that abstained to vote, to take a safe position and, and, and wait and see. Um, and one thing they've made very clear is to say that the, they would have preferred to see a more dialogue-driven approach, a more peace-seeking approach, whilst making it obvious that uh, the sovereignty of every nation should be respected. So I, I think, again, um, the reaction to, to Africa uh, from the West, given recent events, uh, especially when you consider the, the immigration and the, the movement of refugees who are non-white, coming out of Ukraine. I think those issues certainly must play a role um, to some uh, African uh, governments and African countries. Yeah, yeah, countries because this is something that the African Union, um, for all the fact that it's derided, has, has felt it necessary to say that Africans within Ukraine are getting very poor treatment as refugees when they try to get out of the country. Uh, it's done little else, I have to say. Robert, I'm going to come to you on this one. Um, Cyril Ramaphosa, let's stick with him for the time being. Um, were you surprised as somebody who's lived in that country for, for so long that perhaps he decided to, to back those other countries that were saying we don't support this invasion, those that abstained, rather? Um, were you surprised at his attitude or were you thinking this man is just backing the horse that he knows is quite likely to sort of give us the best deal at the end of the day? This may have been a strategic uh, vote or a strategic decision, but it was a politically motivated one for sure. Um, David, I agree with you that uh, President Ramaphosa of South Africa is more a libertarian. He's on a foreign investment drive. Most of that foreign investment will come from supposed Western countries. He's looking at, at European Union countries, the UK, the US, constantly lobbying to bring more foreign investment into South Africa in mining, in transport, of course, in the power sector, less so from Russia. Um, and the reasoning here is that President Ramaphosa, at the moment, he may be in charge of the country, but not fully of his own party. And many within his own party are larking back to the days of uh, Russian support for the African National Congress and see more of an ideological similarity uh, with, with the Russian Federation's government at the moment as well. So President Ramaphosa was not able to uh, vote, maybe he wasn't able to vote his conscience because he had political priorities. This is an election year for South Africa, and President Ramaphosa needs to next year reach out to the country. But far more important than that, this year reach out to his party for a second term. And uh, this vote, as I said earlier, is highly symbolic. And if he had not abstained, this could have come back uh, and, and diminished those chances potentially. OK, Arno, um, there was one country we mentioned at the beginning. We haven't talked about it. That was the only African country that effectively supported what Russia is doing. That is Eritrea for the benefit of our, our viewers. Why was that? I mean, Eritrea is a very interesting case because it's this um, embit country very close to Ethiopia that uh, won independence uh, after a long and brutal war. 
and um, Eritrea is, is ruled by a dictator, Mr. Isis Akweki. And I think um, his vote, from my perspective, is just um, a vote that you'd expect from a from a nation led by a dictator. Uh, I don't think there's more to it than just like this. If you look at the other countries that also voted alongside Russia, it, these are countries that are led by uh, dictators, essentially. Yeah. Do you think Russia would have said thank you, Eritrea, or not even really noticed? I mean, I think uh, given the uh, numbers of uh, the very little numbers of the countries that voted with them, I'm sure they will have noticed and probably uh, sent, sent a thank you note uh, or something like that to, to the capital. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, much appreciated you coming on. We've tried to get through 50 plus countries in less than 30 minutes here on this edition of Roundtable, but we hope we have cleared up some of the confusion, if indeed there, there was any. We've given you the context, we've given you the background to the headlines, and we'll continue to do so as we look at events in Ukraine from the Roundtable perspective. Thanks for watching. Until next time, goodbye.